Young men are not having s. Nearly a third of men under 30 have not had s, and a higher percentage do not have as much s as they'd like. Not exactly surprising, but this kind of statistic is a sign of much deeper problems. Our society criminalizes s and sweeps it under the rug. The consequences are straightforward. There is more violence. Since platforms like Craigslist were banned from advertising s, serious violent crimes against all women, not just s workers, has increased by nearly a fifth. And men who do not have s suffer. They are less likely to be a part of the labor force and more likely to experience depression, nihilism and other mental health issues. The hashtag MeToo movement accomplished so much and we have to take the next step, normalizing having healthy, positive and consensual s decriminalizing s work, funding s education and creating outreach programs that help young people develop healthy s habits. We should be moving toward a right to s People should be able to have s when they feel they want to, and we need to develop services that meet people's needs without attaching the baggage of shame or criminalization. So let's talk about s We need to bring these discussions to the spotlight. Normalizing healthy, positive s will have too many downstream benefits to list. We need to move past our history of shame. It's time to bring s into the light. Salutations and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kodology and I make videos about everything and anything to do with modern society. So as my reading of that Twitter thread suggests, we are going to be talking about the rhetoric of a right to sex. And I'm very interested in this because it is at least currently quite topical. This Twitter thread was highly controversial and I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts about this and whether you agree or disagree with what I'm about to share. The fact that people believe the is in no way confined to the districts where the itself is located. Its impact is not confined in that way. She is specifically victimized because she lives there. I'm asking you to think about her now. Not just the people where the pornography is excluded, but the people where it is. I think when I first read this thread, I was intrigued and I needed a few days to just think about this, especially in relation to my personal life and my personal feelings about sex and sexuality. I think what this tweet represents is how there is this significant divide within the feminist movement and there has pretty much been since about the 1970s. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this divide in short is between the anti porn feminists and the sex positive feminists. The first or former represented by the likes of Andrea Dawkin who was a radical feminist and Catherine McKinnon who is a radical feminist and legal scholar. I actually had the privilege of attending a lecture by her whilst I was at university and it was honestly one of those experiences that makes me very optimistic about the potential of academia. It was transformative and it is I think what university should be individuals having very serious, very controversial, touchy and impactful conversations with each other and it was just incredible seeing this very, well I guess now in today's age not so old, but this uh, 70 plus year old woman speaking to all these men and women who were in their 20s and having this incredible conversation. Not all of us were in agreement at all, but it was just, it was electric, truly electric. So I have a lot of thoughts about this just based on that conversation, that lecture. And then on the other hand, we have the sex positive feminists who are mainly represented by the writings of the journalist and feminist Ellen Willis. Now, long story short, Ellen Willis and the sex positive feminists won. And it is quite clear today that they have most definitely won in our modern age. If we just look at the proliferation of the likes of OnlyFans, if we look at the increasing commercialization and commercial appeal of sex, particularly that of perceiving the sexualization of women as being an empowering experience because women are earning money and have the potential to earn money and influence and clout from it. The perception of Kim Kardashian today relative to the that of, say, Kim Kardashian maybe 50 years ago, if she had done what she does now or did now back then, is very different. And we most definitely, I think, subconsciously at least, have the sex positive feminist to thank for that. But I think in making the personal political, the sex positive feminists have intentionally made sex public, but I think they have unintentionally made it political. And they have politicized sex in a direction that goes 
is completely contrary to its objectives. Because when something is political, it is public knowledge. And in that, it is up for scrutiny, it is up for debate, and it is up for constant redefinition and a perception that it is associated with progress and with improvement. And we can just see that with very mundane things such as relationship columns in Cosmopolitan and Gamma magazine, GQ, debates around what constitutes consent, pornography and its proliferation, the emergence and increasing respect of disciplines such as gender studies, as well as an increasing fixation and centering of children in relation to their sex and sexuality and maturity. Not just because of greater sexual freedom, but also because of our greater information and knowledge about, I would even say, we've created a sort of science of sex. And I think this all stems down to the increasing politicization of sex. It's increasing publicity, the public knowledge of sex, if we're going to talk about it in a very Michel Foucauldian sense. Because I do believe that now we live in a cultural milieu that has publicized and politicized desire. Good sex has, I would say, quite literally been reduced and naturalized to meaning consent. If you go to any modern university, you will have to sit through a lecture or a talk by your college or university about consent. I'm sure all of you have seen the YouTube video of the cup of tea. They just don't want tea, okay? And I only say this and sort of quasi ridicule this because I think within this whole rhetoric of consent, okay, healthy sex equals, according to this rhetoric and discourse which we are now subsumed in, consent from all parties involved. And in this, which does stem from the sex positive feminist activist of the 70s onwards, it becomes very complicated to argue against the declaration that pornography is good. Within the modern porn industry, there is a consensual agreement, which is oftentimes merely an implied consensual agreement, that the porn stars are consenting adults of 18 years or over, and that in exchange for publicity and money, they are agreeing to be objectified by the acts themselves and by viewers and also those partaking in the acts as well. And these viewers enter into implied consent throughout space and time. Time. It's not sort of an immediate or present day thing or experience. It is basically on the internet or within the realm of an implied consent for years, decades, a lifetime. And with the proliferation of OnlyFans, it has only made this conversation more complicated and difficult to have. Because you can be branded a misogynist or sexist or even somebody who is willing to take away the rights of somebody who feels empowered via doing OnlyFans, particularly that of women doing OnlyFans. If you propose that a woman posting something on such a site is demeaning or wrong, is un empowering. During my first degree, I read Jacques Lacan, whose work tells us that whatever gives you pleasure gives you power. This throws the traditional model of vertical power into question. Therefore, whatever interests you sexually is what you should practice, law willing. So if you're sexually submissive, you are disempowered if you do not admit this to yourself, as you deny yourself access to pleasure. Porn stars and directors get power from expanding their limitations of their imaginations and bodily experiences. Anti-porn feminists make mistake extreme sex with a lack of consent. That is, they compare sex with the rest of social life. And one thing that I'd argue has not changed very much since the sex wars of the 1970s is this fixation on the bodies of women, uh, namely the sellers of a product, rather than the demand and the consumers of said product. But uh, and, and there's no point taking the photos off because the images are out there anyway and once you sign that release form that's one of the things you must make that decision you know I know I'll never be a ch teaching children uh, it's mm -hmm. an important decision to make but the thing is that what I what I've seen about two or three porn stars that have asked me to do that the problem is the outs they don't regret what they've done certainly not while they're in, in the industry um, when they leave it they have problems for instance getting other jobs or having access to their children I've known people who've been denied access to their children through the divorce courts for, for being in pornography and then they take on this kind of external guilt for having done things in retrospect and yet I know those people when they were working in the industry were loving it and I think that's one of the problems is we need to naturalize it so that that people don't have to 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 go through that afterwards I think it's really wrong and so within all this context we get to a point of a right to sex because 
with this context, sex is public knowledge. Sex is politicized. The personal is political. And therefore, sex is now open to the public domain and to public scrutiny and discourse rules and regulations. And the thing with all politics since the beginning of time is that it often entails a schism between the haves and the have-nots. For instance, the majority and minorities, the privilege and the underprivileged men and women, the franchised and the disenfranchised. And so within modern conversations and the politicization of sex today, we have the exact same thing as any politics would have. We have those who are sexually marginalized and excluded, and in their eyes, they perceive themselves as being unjustly marginalized and excluded. And like any marginalized group, they ought to have, or at least as so far as the political narrative and discourse goes, their rights recognised, protected and promoted. And thus enters a discourse of a right to sex. And so I would argue that a right to sex is not something that has been invented by incels. It's not something that they just have picked out of a hat and see themselves as being unjustly marginalised sexually by women and by modern society. It is a product of both the increasing commodification of sex and sexuality, as well as sex being a political and politicised issue and concern. Itself stemming largely from the quote-unquote victory of sex sex positive feminism. Now just a disclaimer, this is not me at all saying that feminists are to blame for the state of the world. No, not at all. I am proudly a feminist, but I do appreciate, unlike sort of the mainstream derogatory notion of a feminist, that feminism is incredibly nuanced, that individuals within feminism disagree, and that feminism is a very complex, very multifaceted philosophy. And so I am not in any way trying to say that feminism is bad or wrong for society. Oh no, not at all. Like any philosophy and any position, it has its flaws and its faults. This is also me not in any way saying that the left is to blame for this and that we should do what the right says, which is ultimately believing that sex is a completely private thing and need not be spoken about and that it is never ever changing. Oh no, because the right are just as involved and complicit in all of this as everybody else in society. Just look at Ashley Madison's statistics. Not only are the majority of Ashley Madison's patrons based in the US and are men. Most of them are also Republicans. So let's all get off our high horses and not try to make this a political issue, even though this is about the politicization of sex. Because what I am advocating for is for us to depoliticize sex. The Me Too movement accomplished a ton and now we need to take the next step in normalizing healthy, positive, consensual sex decriminalizing sex work, funding sex education, and creating outreach programs for young people to develop healthy sexual habits are all key tools we need in our sexual health toolkit. We should be moving towards a right to sex. People should be able to have sex when they feel like it, and we need to have the services to meet those needs without attaching the baggage of shame or criminalization. So let's talk about sex. I would say that my main qualm with the politicization of sex and thus the inferring notion of a right to sex is the language of consent. Consent, by definition, infers negotiation. It involves transaction and transactional language. And it ultimately involves an exchange between parties in pursuit of some end goal. However, this end goal doesn't have to be a shared goal. That is, the end goal doesn't have to be something desired by all parties involved, or for instance, in the matter of sex, by both parties involved, provided that both parties voluntarily agree upon, let's say, the journey, the means to the end. And in this, sex is reduced to means justifying the ends. Okay, healthy sex is seen as means-based, at least according to what I can interpret from Alexander Hunt's Twitter thread. Because in the case of sex work, for instance, one is voluntarily agreeing to the stipulations, the conditions, the desires, and the wishes of 
another, that is of the predominantly male client. And I would say that my issue with this is that, well, firstly, as I said, the notion of good sex and healthy sexual relations is reduced to merely being that of consent, thus being reduced to the means as opposed to the ends. There doesn't have to be a shared end, provided that there is a shared, at least, journey to the means. And secondly, or on the other hand, my issue is also with the fact that our politicization of sex in relation to consent is about implied consent. There's different kinds of consent, but when it comes to sex, it is primarily about implied consent. You sort of go with the flow, with the circumstances and situation that you find yourself in with somebody. You gauge with the other person. You vibe with them, as Gen Z likes to say. And I would say that my problem isn't with implied consent as a concept in and of itself. My issue is that implied consent is not good bedfellows with our modern age. That is, in a modern age in which sexual encounters are increasingly being interpreted, seen, pursued, and sought after via the internet and dating apps. And I think the issue with this lies in two things which feed all each other. Firstly, dating apps and pornographic sites see individuals, especially their target demographics of men, as not men but consumers. Therefore, nothing is in their best interest in as much as it is in the interest of making money and, importantly, keeping them on the sites. Pornography doesn't make us less repressed. Pornography is a way of making money out of the fact that we are repressed. There are so many more men on dating apps than women and this is not because women are more picky or because we are only interested in high value men. Actually I think the Kinsey report says it best and probably always will. Generally while a man cannot help being turned on if given the right physical stimulation, a woman's erotic feelings depend more on her feelings about the situation. Men's sexual feelings start suddenly in puberty and rapidly climbs through the teenage years before leveling off in the 20s. A woman's sexual feeling is more like a slow climb, and her responses are more psychological. The desire for oral, genital contact is much greater among males, and male stimulation of the female partner's genitalia is much more common than a woman's stimulation of the man's. This is the case for all mammals, and suggests that, rather than being prudish, women are biologically less interested in men's anatomy. Visuals are everything. Generically and biologically speaking, men are a lot easier to turn on than women. I don't agree with this whole Heartedly, but I think in very generic terms, I would say that it is very obvious and very clear that there is not a lot of knowledge or information around women's sexuality because it is so complex and it is so different and contrasted so much to male sexuality and at least the medical knowledge and information around it. And this most definitely includes puberty as well as menopause. So on the one hand, you have a significantly greater number of men on dating apps, seeking sexual relations and sexual encounters, as well as far more men on the likes of OnlyFans as consumers and on porn sites. And within all this, a lot of money is being made by, for instance, porn stars and by very sex positive female content creators on the likes of OnlyFans, for instance, and also a far safer form of sex work. And depending on how you see it, there's also a inadvertent advantage for women if they do decide to go onto dating apps. Because there are so many more men, they can choose from a far greater pool than would otherwise be the case. Irrespective of whether whether this in any way aligns to how women view men or care to see men, in which it isn't as much about looks as it is with men looking at women, but a lot more as the Kinsey report suggests about psychology as well as about situation and really about the individual man himself, getting to know him and trust him over time. But obviously in our age of politicized sex and therefore the publicity and commodification of sex, everything is basically reduced to the bare minimum of what sex is, which is just physical, flesh and heat. And so I think this leads to what on the other hand is an implication of a right to sex. The internet has created distance. 
it has put us no longer face to face with people and therefore no longer allows us to acclimatize ourselves to human instinct, to engaging with the opposite sex in situations in which we have to, over time, understand and develop an understanding of individuals in person. We can see that younger generations are having quite a fraught time when it comes to their mental health, as well as when it comes to understanding and defining healthy encounters with the opposite sex. Because this can sometimes be the issue with having far too much information and therefore a sort of scientific narrative, a narrative of expertise around something as complex, as nuanced, as, in my opinion, sacred and personal, very individualistic and what should be apolitical as sex. You have many voices claiming to be experts on it, many voices claiming to know everything about it, and therefore contradiction, conflicts, and like we see now and saw in the 70s, debates or wars around what even constitutes sex. And I think this really feeds into my problem with Alexandra Hunt's Twitter thread. Young men aren't having sex. Nearly a third of men under 30 have not had sex. And an even higher percentage are not having as much sex as they'd like. Not exactly a surprising statistic, but it's a sign of a much deeper problem. We have so much to say and so much knowledge about the journey, both formal knowledge and informal knowledge, for instance, that of pickup artists and the manosphere. The manosphere's plethora of information and go-tos about how to attract women, how to get women, information about women's nature and men's nature in pursuit of sex. You are boring. Your messages don't excite her, they don't stand out, and they don't give her any motivation to meet up with you. How do I know this? Because I know women. I know women. However, in all of this, we have virtually nothing to say about the destination itself, about sex. The journey is so politicized and so publicized that it completely dilutes the nuance and sacred nature of the destination. So much is put into getting there. There's so much alleged knowledge and information about getting there that it really just completely decimates the experience itself. How often have you heard people saying that sex is actually very underwhelming, that a lot of sex is sort of just about the getting there as opposed to the actual act itself. A lot of people don't even know what constitutes sex in and of itself and you know I think rightly so it's very specific to people and to their individual situation as it should be. I know women. And again, I think this all has so much to just do with our modern age. And I think we are actually just looking at this quite honestly, very scared of sex and very scared of the possibility and the prospect of sex when it obviously comes to being incredibly vulnerable and exposed to an individual who at some point in your life is likely a stranger to you. And I think we can see this just in the way that sexual intercourse is colloquially considered contemporarily. I think if we just look at the place where all the best knowledge about the evolution of our language is concerned, the Urban Dictionary, if we just look at the Urban Dictionary, we can see how sex is really seen in our day and age. Just a warning that there is crude language ahead. Do forgive me and humankind. So words used colloquially to define sexual intercourse are as follows on the Urban Dictionary. Fucking, screwing, shagging, pounding, hooking up, slamming, banging. And what I found interesting about these words is that there is absolutely nothing pleasant or good associated with them. Even their sound on the palate is just very rough, very unpleasant. It's all associated with pain, with rage, with anger. And I only make reference to this because of something that I really think is missing from all conversations about sex which we have. And I only make reference to these colloquial terms because of something that I want to highlight. Modern references and innuendos about sex 
are inherently lacking in the very thing that we not only want, but need in order to live the most fulfilling, meaningful and connected lives possible with other people, specifically with a significant other or others. And yes, I do mean love, not in the sort of Jane Austen sense, but love as in sort of the, the passage and the difficulties and complexities of love, but also that knowing that you have somebody who you can trust, say. Okay. Love, by its very nature, is unworldly. And it is for this reason, rather than its rarity, that it is not only apolitical, but anti-political. Perhaps the most powerful of all anti-political forces. This was written by Hannah Arendt, who I think should be compulsory reading for everybody. I will continue to promote Hannah Arendt on this channel. She writes absolutely superbly about politics, but also things which ought not to be considered or governed by politics. And I would say that love, intimacy, sex, are those things. And I honestly think that we have gotten to this point, we have gotten to this point of sort of no resolution, no solution of any shape or form, because we have politicized sex, we have politicized love. We see the personal as political, and in that we just bring misery into our personal lives. Caritas is the love that is the basis for recognizing ourselves and others as unique individuals and so makes possible the development and expression of human freedom. Because Hannah Arendt sees love as a precondition for human freedom. It's when we recognize people as individuals rather than as generalizations, when we humanize an individual and we know them mind and body. It is inherently apolitical. It cannot be political. It is unique and exceptional. And that is what all sex should be seen as, as opposed to these generalizations, as opposed to a sort of science of sex, a notion that there's a formula to getting women, a formula or method to getting men. There should really only be a formula to getting a specific man or a specific woman. And each formula is specific to each individual involved. It can't be replicated or or repeated by any other human being. And it's interesting in this to see how the Urban Dictionary defines making love, contrary to how it defines sex and the colloquial language used for sex. Making love is sex with emotional significance. It's often characterized by tenderness, caressing, etc. Sex as ultimate physical manifestation of romantic love. It is the opposite of fucking. It is often used in romance novels for dramatic effect. Every time we make love, I know that I am the luckiest guy in the world to have her. Because when I hear about sex being discussed on the internet today, especially within the manosphere, especially in relation to podcasts focused on dating and relationships, it just feels inherently disconnected. Connected. It all seems so heavily disengaged from anything aside from the objective of getting off. Everything is either about numbers or the myths around orgasms, as well as the mythical perceptions of how to achieve one or how to make sure that a woman gets one. So I think with all this ambiguity, all this friction, all this inevitable animosity between the sexes, which is another consequence of politicizing sex and romance and love. The political is always a friend-enemy distinction. It's about defining your friends and defining your enemies. And right now, men and women are completely at odds with each other in the modern age. Incels perceive women as the enemy and also a small pool of men who seemingly get all the women as being being enemies as well. Feminists generically see insults as the enemy and also the patriarchy, as is upheld by men and their subconscious bias toward other men and toward the status quo. And I think now with the mainstreaming of the manosphere as well as a lot of animosity toward feminism, the generic idea of feminism and feminists in general, we are seeing a cultural-wide backlash against women and against against modern women specifically. And so with all of this, 
We now have conversations about a seeming right to sex. Do we even have a consensual idea of what this is when we can't even agree on the process of how we got to this point? I mean, female sexuality is still taboo and is still just shrouded in absolute fantasy and mysticism. Thank you in great part to the internet and pornography. And nowhere is this clearer than in the generic manosphere and its obsession with women as they see them as ultimately being nothing more than Instagram models and on insult forums. Our very sexual anatomy, sex drive and an understanding and just real consideration of it is lacking. So I do think we need to have a conversation about this idea of a right to sex because I don't think we have anybody but ourselves just as a culture, as a society collectively to blame for getting to this point. It's no specific individuals, no specific groups fault. It's not women's fault, not men's fault, not I don't know whose fault. But I think it's important for us to recognize and to try to make the connections of how we got here in order to see how we can get beyond here. In my opinion, Opinion, we most definitely are not going to get beyond this point at which we find ourselves by continuing to see sex as a political thing, as a public situation and thing to be discussed, dissected, created into a science and therefore merely made into information pamphlets, into slogans, into buzzwords. Not only is that not in any way sexy or not in any way really what happens in the boudoir, but also makes the personal political. And as we know, just with all politics, politics is just misery. It's anger, it's animosity, it's destructive. Why on earth we would want to make personal, very individualistic things that bring us happiness, that bring us joy, that promote our mental health and well-being into the domain of politics and its absolute state of misery is beyond me. So I don't think that we're going to be able to get beyond this point if we continue to politicize sex and love and romance, if we continue to see the personal as political. Because in all politics, there is always a language of entitlement. And there are always those who feel that they are not entitled, that they are the have-nots, that they are the marginalized, the minorities, and the underprivileged. And that therefore, in order to live a life as fulfilling as the haves, as the majority, as the enfranchised, they have rights which must be protected or must be promoted. And in this sense, we've created a very, I would say, unhealthy and potentially destructive situation where the commodification and politicization of sex is now seen as a right by many an individual and increasingly so. And that is no way to get to what we actually really need, which is meaningful, fulfilling, sacred relationships with individuals whom we have humanized, whom we have gotten to know, whom we are willing to go through life with in the romantic sense, in the very normal, mundane sense of everyday life, which is very specific, very niche, very individualistic to people and their personal lives not their political lives. So yes, those are just my thoughts about conversations that I've seen online recently about the right to sex and conversations about who is to blame, I guess, for instigating this rhetoric, for instigating the propositions put forward by Alexandra Hunt, for instance. So I'd be very interested to hear your opinions and thoughts on this because this is something that interests me greatly. Thank you so very much for watching. Please do subscribe if you enjoy the content. Please do also give this video a thumbs up and I would love to hear from you in the comment section down below. I will be engaging with this comment section. I have been keeping a distance from my latest videos mainly because I've been going through quite a lot just uh, I would say mentally but also physically I've just been very very ill and I am finally recovering getting better everything is well now so I thank you sincerely for your patience thank you as always to my patrons for your undying support and for your faith in me and the process of this channel and I will of course see you very soon in the next one